Hello, my name is Brent, and this is part of the Saline Valley Salt Tram. And back in 1913, when this thing was built, it was one of the biggest engineering feats the state has ever seen. You know, at that point in time, it was the steepest aerial tramway in the United States. And it was used to take salt from Saline Valley behind me all the way up and over this mountain range and into Owens Valley over the course of 13 and a half miles. And from where I'm standing, about seven miles and 7,000 feet of elevation below me is where this tram station starts. And that is where I'm hiking to in this video. So the Saline Valley Salt Tram, it's very difficult to even describe how monumental of task this was. You know, at that time in California, it rivals the LA Aqueduct as the biggest thing humans did. You know, the point of this tramway system was to take salt from Saline Valley and bring it all the way around into Owens Valley. And they discovered salt originally about 1904 in Saline Valley. And it was tested as coming the purest salt in the world. And so what they originally would do was load it into wagons, drive it around to a pass, bring it into Owens Valley and sell it. And that would take something like two days by wagon. And the cost related to that and just the difficulty made it not very financially viable. And so eventually two dreamers stood down in the valley, looked up and thought, hey, what if we just take this salt just straight up and over? <laughs> and to describe how crazy of thought that even is, so you would start in Saline Valley at an elevation of 1,000 feet. And the top would be at an elevation of 8,700 feet. And then it would have to drop back down to 3,000 feet over a 13 and a half mile tramway. A tramway that would be the steepest tramway in the United States if they pulled it off. And just to describe in between those points what they were working with, they were working with just cliffs shale cliffs with washes, with waterfalls you have to hike down, no roads, just the most preposterous route you can imagine, plus the most inhospitable place in the United States. We're talking about Death Valley. We're talking about a place where working there, it's gonna peak out over 120 degrees Fahrenheit during the summer. And you gotta figure, it's not like they were bringing it up in machinery or anything. This is a time where all they had was a dream, manpower and mules, but they did it. You know, they pulled it off. You know, by 1913, they were sending salt from Saline Valley into Owens Valley, 800 pounds at a time in these buckets. And the tramway employed between 40 and 60 people and unfortunately never made a profit. You know, they could never make it financially work. They ran it different companies till about 1930. And these days it's abandoned, you know, it's just a monument to a big dream. But I don't think that means it was unsuccessful. I just think by them proving that was possible, someone else probably looked to that to make their own dream a reality. You know, when I'm struggling here at Cerro Gordo, I love to just go to places like that. It just reminds me of things I can do if I put my mind to it. Because it's so difficult to get to, almost nobody goes down there. You know, I, I searched far and wide trying to find somebody that's hiked the salt tram into Saline Valley. And you're not gonna find them, you know, it's just, it's too difficult, it's too dangerous, it's too hot. But for me, like, I just couldn't get the thought out of my mind. I talked to my friend Tim, and Tim is the guy, if you need to know where anything is in Owens Valley, Tim knows. He's been there twice on his dirt bike, because that's all he does is ride around all day looking for stuff on his dirt bike in the valley. And he knows where everything is. So I was like, hey Tim, think about like I'm the salt tram. You know, would you meet me down at the bottom uh, when I finish this thing? And he said, sure. And so our plan was this. You know, we both have inreaches. We're essentially satellite communication where you can text people anywhere in the world. And if necessary, you press an SOS button and somebody's gonna come find you in a helicopter and know right where you are. Tim was gonna know when I left Cerro Gordo, I was gonna let him know when I departed the summit station and he knew roughly when I was gonna get down to the bottom. And in between, with the inreach, you can track somebody's path. So if I stopped for too long, he's gonna send me a message. Hey man, why are you stopped? So that was our plan, but uh, all good plans get tested sometimes. And this week, our best plan 
was definitely tested. So this hiking day started around 5 a.m. I knew it was going to be a scorcher out there, so I kind of wanted to get on the road as quickly as I could. And the first step of the Salt Tram hike was just getting to the summit station. <laughs> From Cerro Gordo, it's about a six or seven mile ride out to the summit station, but it's probably one of the most beautiful rides anywhere around Cerro Gordo. So here we are at the Salt Tram Summit Station and it goes from 1100 feet in elevation down there where I'll be walking today to 8700 feet in elevation where I'm standing now. So there's a ton of gain along the way and if you can see there's more stations down that way. Uh, a very popular road goes down this way into Owens Valley but very few people ever walk it towards Death Valley because you just end up in the middle of nowhere. So for me today what I'm going to do is just follow that line, you know, wherever it goes, I go and walk down and end in Death Valley. But it's going to be very, very warm today in Death Valley, potentially over 120. But today's the day, you know, there's a little bit of cloud coverage and it's beautiful. You know, you have to imagine just the engineering feat it was to build this thing back in 1911. You know, if you look around and look at the train, it's not like they had roads, it's just cliffs like that. So it's incredible just to think about what these guys had to go through to accomplish this job. And uh, luckily there's a little bit of wind, which you might hear, but uh, that and the cloud cover should keep it a little cooler. So I can only imagine what an entire day of this is going to be like. I'm not even to the first station yet. And I'm already talking about how steep it is. So that's a good thing, huh? Nope, we continue. There's a moment there. There's a moment where I was like, well, I don't have to do this. All right, just approaching this first transfer station. All sorts of old wire here still. I imagine the further I get away from the beaten path, the more stuff is gonna be left behind. Look at this. Hell yeah. Got an old uh, something. I guess maybe that's how they brought the salt. So I'm not even totally sure how they brought the salt. That would make sense so it was covered so they didn't lose any on the way up. So this obviously would go on this cable system. This would take it down or up wherever they're trying to go. And that's interesting. There's another one over here. So like at Cerro Gordo, there wasn't these tops because I guess the galena was so heavy that it wasn't going to fall out. Then maybe salt because it's a little bit lighter. Yeah, look, that's the same one. They're almost like barrels that have a lid on them. Cause see that white stuff way out there? I believe I have to hike all the way there. And if I follow the tram the whole way, it's not gonna be the quickest way. You know, they're not gonna go up the wash or something that makes it an easy hike. They're gonna be going the shortest distance. So that's gonna be up and over peaks. How do they do this? It's ridiculous, really. Even these, I mean, that's like what a 25, 30 foot beam. Like, look at the ground. It is not anywhere near flat. I mean, how do you even getting these beams here? It's ridiculous. How, how is any of this stuff here? It was so steep in places that anytime I could grab on to the cable that used to be used for the tramway, I'd use that as a guide to not slide off. So a lot of the times I couldn't even go straight down it. I'd be going sideways, kind of walking like a crab across the side of the mountain. 
just to not try to slip down it. As you can see, it's not even as steep. It just goes through like washes that are intersecting. So you just have to go down like a little ravine almost and then back up over and over and over again. This station looks like it's starting to, you know, succumb to the weather and the elements out here. And the reality is this whole tramway will eventually, you know, given enough time, this thing won't be here anymore. You know, in a hundred years, the only thing that'll be left of these types of engineering feats will be, you know, videos like this. If you're able to, I would definitely encourage going out and checking out any aerial tramways you can find, they are just something to be seen. I mean, look at that line. It's still up, you know, 110 years later, it's still off the ground and we're on a side cliff in the middle of nowhere. And it's incredible, you know, it's crazy to think about, oh, in another hundred years, this will just be a distant memory but maybe that's how it's supposed to be. Maybe some of this stuff is supposed to be fleeting. And that's some of the beauty in it. You know, if this was made out of steel, and I know I could see it, you know, in another hundred years, would it have the same appeal? I don't know. I have no idea what happens beyond that cliff there. I'm very curious. And in between me and that cliff is just yet another wash. I see now why people say that the pyramids were built by aliens because like, how is all this stuff here? You know, I know this is in the pyramids, but none of it makes sense. Looks like we're coming up on a really big one. This one is the one that I saw on the cliff a while back and I was wondering what was beyond it. because I haven't been able to see past this peak yet, but look at this structure. I mean, this is still in amazing shape. Look at the middle. I think that's like a weight system to keep everything in place. See with the big chains? That sounds good. It's remarkable how big these structures are. There's another one of the buckets, also from the Trenton Metal Company from Trenton, New Jersey. Ah, looks like just more of the same, more cliffs, more valleys, more hiking. So I just took a little peek, you know, just to check with the drone how things are coming along. And uh, it seemed like things were leveling out a little bit. And I thought I was over some steep parts. No, in fact, not even close. It gets extraordinarily steep coming up. It was apparent that the terrain was gonna get very difficult from there on out. You know, first it was side hill shale, no problem, no problem. Then it started becoming cliffs. So it'll be cliffs, down into a wash, back up a cliff, over, down into a wash, back up a cliff, et cetera, et cetera. It is right now, we're at 6,800 feet in elevation. And I believe this starts at 1,100 feet in elevation. So there's 5,700 feet of drop to go. And I've only gone down 1,500 feet in drop so far. <laughs> It is not leveling out. In fact, it's about to get very, very, very steep. Look at this thing. It's just built on the side of a cliff. If you look down this way, pretty high up. These things are just getting more and more ridiculous to build. Our beautiful cloud coverage I was here earlier is gone. So it's about to get roasting hot. I'm talking 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So let us continue. <laughs> There's this little kind of like shaded spot. I thought it'd be a good spot for some animals. But if you look, these really old cans and even a shelf built up in here. So I think back in the day, they used this as a place to get cool for a second. You know, maybe even camp out overnight. See the old cans? 
that shelf over there. It's kind of the only break from the sun you get out here in Death Valley. So I imagine they were just looking for anywhere to stay cool. So they had that. Well, I got down one cliff, but now I'm in a wash of cliffs. As you can see, I need to get over there to get back on track. And it's just turned from a uh, hike to a rock climbing situation where I have no rope. So I did just watch Free Solo about El Capitan. So if you can do that, I can do the 25 foot right there. This hike was also humbling in a way that only nature can be. A reminder never to get too comfortable, to remember your place in the world. You know, I was walking, looking at all these structures and just thinking how impressive it was that man had overcome such obstacles to build these things where they did. And then not even two hours later, I was just being beaten down by 120 degree heat. You know, this heat that literally has killed people not too far from where I was hiking. You know, heat that could easily kill you if you don't have a plan in place. And even with the best plan, a rock slide, a flash flood, a rattlesnake could have ended my hike and my life in an instant. You know, and elsewhere, tornadoes, hurricanes, lightning strikes, they all have this power to humble us, you know, to remind ourselves of our place in the world. None of those things care about wealth or nationality or your profession. All those things just disappear in the shadow of nature's power. And if you expose yourself to nature enough and allow those thoughts to enter your mind, you leave nature with a greater sense of humility than when you went in. And that's just one of my favorite parts of being out in nature, just being reminded of our relative insignificance to bring the focus way out from just our person. And I think that's a reminder that's good for everybody to have. This is pretty crazy. I found what looks to be a desert oasis or Obviously, some of the water is pooling here. There's just thick weeds, and to be honest, this is kind of the last thing in the world I want to walk through in Death Valley with snakes and all that. I would not recommend this hike to my worst enemies. It is truly miserable. And it is starting to get hot, hot. But I think I'm just about to that next transfer station. It's making some progress. There it is, the next big one. And now that the cover is gone, it very much feels like I'm just trudging through the desert. I've come down 2,500 feet, but I still have double that to go down, which is uh, daunting at this moment in time, but I'll take a break up there. Made it to this one that was in the distance on the hill. And it's incredible the amount of stuff that's still here. So look at the tracks. So that was the track that the buckets will come in on. Even the little pulleys are still there, the cable. It's just these giant pieces of metal. Also from the Trenton Iron Company. You know, up here you got, of course, the Prince Albert, a bunch of pickaxe heads, homemade coffee pot maybe. Oh wow, look at that. From an old pocket watch. Guy probably keeping time out here looking up like, when do I get to go home? <laughs> probably an oil bucket, yep, with still oil in it for greasing, uh, or greasing this, these wheels. Probably to be greased all day. Little bucket to grease them. This is incredible. It's just kind of left here, you know? Any sense of being tired just left me. I was pumped up again, you know? I was excited, I was going around, finding all these cool artifacts. The buckets were still hanging from the cable in this amazing way. Oh, wow, look at that. Look at the bucket. 
And now you can see how dramatic it was from where I came from. So that cliff way up there and the cliff way up beyond that. Oh, look at this, the underbelly. Just the amount, like how did they get these wheels here, you know? So probably some of the gears you can see to crank everything above. It says 15. Very likely could be the year. Because this was built in 1911. And I believe only ran for a handful of years. Should I grease it up and give it a go? Just over to this side is like an old cabin site. Where obviously one of the guys probably that was working out here lived. Because I didn't even think about that. It's not like you're coming and going every day. If you're working at this place, you're living at this place. Way out here. And so, a little conductor, stove. You know, we got a bunch of stoves like that at Cerro Gordo. Oh man, look, even he's making some muffins. So this is it, this is uh, this guy's life. This wasn't just some, you know, monument from the past. This was someone's home at one point in time. You know, some guy came up here, lived up here, and possibly died up there. You know, it just brought a very human element to everything around me. And I loved it. There's a lot of cabin sites around here. I imagine if you spent some time, you could find a bunch of other ones. There's the kitchen. Maybe out there, there are more, more little cabin sites, but it humanizes it more, you know, that this wasn't just salt coming through here. There's another bed. Of course, there's people staying out here. Someone had to man it. Imagine living out here. I think I have a hard time getting food supplies. I imagine your life out, your menu out here was uh, canned goods, canned goods, and canned goods. This hawk keeps circling me as if it thinks I'm dead or something. Still alive. So given this was 1911 that they built this, it's kind of surprising that it had electrical. I mean, I guess they had to, to power it all the way up some of these canyons, but Cerro Gordo didn't get electric until 1916. As I was browsing around that middle transfer station, I came upon a log book. Let's see if someone signed the book. You know, a log book that showed who was the last people that had hiked out to it. And reading through it, my entire mentality towards the hike changed pretty much immediately. Because one entry said, came up from the bottom, used 300 feet of rope left from some friends above. And the next entry after that said, hike down from the top, camp for the night, walk back to the top. And there was no real entry of somebody hiking from the top to the bottom. And the guy mentioning rope made me start to wonder. You know, I know I had already come down about 3,500 feet in elevation and I had about another 4,000 feet in elevation to go down. I started thinking, why did he need a rope? You know, was he just exaggerating a little bit or what's going on? And my options at that point were, you know, turn back or keep going. I just read in the, that guidebook that they came up via a rope trail when they came up in 2010, whoever signed that book. Which makes me concerned, which leads me to believe that potentially further down this, there's going to be a part where I can't pass without ropes. I mean, maybe there's like a waterfall in the wash or something. Which would really suck because that would mean turning around and going all the way back up. I don't know if I have the stamina to even do. So I'm gonna hope that's not the case, but I guess we'll see here shortly, huh? All right, so the tramway's up there. I'm still down in the wash. I've abandoned following the tramway. It's just, as you can see, it's just way too steep and I've fallen 20 times a day and it's hot, hot. And I do have to be conscious of my water. And so at this point, my main goal is just getting out of here, to be honest. Uh, my friend Tim is at the bottom of the tramway system, because that's where he expected to pick me up. 
later today. And obviously we don't have cell phone service and my inReach is acting up. Or my bag slid down when I was going down one of those washes. And so it's a, having a hard time sending the messages. So my only goal now is just to get out of here. I think I've seen 20, 25 of the tramway stations. So it seems like more than enough. And given the fact that I'm in Death Valley with no communication, with limited water, I'm not taking any more chances. I am ready to GTFO, so to speak. I'm now down in the, down in the wash below the trail and the bird that's still circling me, which seems very rude. This wash is super smooth. It's like it's been evened out for a long time with a lot of water. And so far there's no waterfall, which is my great fear now after reading that. Oh, there's the next transfer station. The route takes you, it takes you into this wash. Like it kind of follows the trail of the cables above. Oof. Starting to get... The wash was getting narrower, so it's starting to become very steep on the sides. And there started to be little five foot waterfalls, dry waterfalls, they had to kind of slip and slide down. And then it was a 10 foot waterfall that you're slipping and sliding down. Well, I kind of committed now coming down that from up there, so... Man, I really hope this wash is the way out. Getting a bit nervous because my drone's dead now. I can't use it for scouting. I almost lost it right there. This camera's even running low. Each time you slip and slide down a waterfall, you're committing even further to that path working out for you. Because if it doesn't, you're gonna have to turn around and climbing back up these slick waterfalls is significantly more difficult than sliding down them. And given the fact that the walls around you this way are going up steeper and also very slick, you could be in for a really bad time if things don't work out. Really committed now after coming down off of that. We're just walking the wash. That was a, a steep one with no rope. Note to self, bring rope next time. <laughs> Well, I made it through a bunch of waterfalls that I kind of had to play slip and slide there for a little bit. I'm still on track. You can see the tram there and there. And up there, it looks like there's a road going up to it or something. I'm not through this wash yet. I'm still a little bit nervous that it's gonna come upon a really big waterfall. You know, so far there's been a 20 or 30 footer, which is traversable. Any more than that, I'm not going to feel comfortable just sliding down. And it's like each step further in the wash, I'm committing to the wash further. So I think when I get up on this road up here, you can kind of see, I might take that, go back up the high route. If for no other reason than then, I could at least see what I'm working with inside the wash. And that might be the best approach of them all, I think. So there's the tramway. It's getting real, real hot. Well, down to 4,200 feet in elevation. Oh, still climbing down these rocks. You know, I had my inReach. I was being able to communicate with Tim. But at the end of the day, he's still miles away from me, so the only thing he could do was call and help, which was the last thing that I wanted to do. And I remember at that point, my focus went from, oh, this is an enjoyable walk, to let me just focus on getting out of here.
So there's about three hours that I didn't film at all. It was just purely in problem solving mode. You know, I would come across the waterfall, have to get down this waterfall and try to make sure that I could get down the next waterfall to get down the next waterfall to eventually get to the bottom of this hill. And it all kind of came to a head about one mile before I got to the end of the tramway. And there, there was a waterfall that was about 40 feet down. It was quite steep and I was exhausted. You know, I was probably six or eight hours into the hike at that point. Tim was a mile away and I knew he was a mile away because we had been texting. And there was always a plan that if I was running low on water, that I'd have him start hiking some water up the, up the wash. And I had brought a gallon and a half with me, but I was running low. And while I was sitting there looking at this waterfall, the main concern of mine was just not that I could get down, but in my tired state making a mistake. You know, I have to be very conscious that I was significantly more tired than I was when I started down this wash. And one mistake falling 30 feet, you're gonna have a pretty bad time. So I texted Tim, hey, can you start walking up the wash, bring me some water? And he started up and we realized that when he got to be 0.2 miles away from me, there was over a thousand feet in elevation change between where he was and where I was. So this wash was incredibly steep right where I was. And so at that point, Tim wasn't able to get any closer to me. You know, it was way too steep for him to walk up to meet me. And so I basically had three options. I could one, turn around, try to walk back up all these dozen waterfalls I'd slip and slowed down. Two, I could try to traverse my way down it, you know, free climbing down a very slick structure. Or three, you know, I could start walking up the mountain that the wash was intersecting on and just basically walk around the waterfall and then back down into the wash. But that would require probably another 500 feet of walking up over and then another 500 feet of walking back down into the wash to try to avoid this waterfall. And in the end, I realized that that was probably the safest option. And so over the course of another hour or two, I walked back up, over, back down. And at that point I was feeling pretty nervous. You know, I was pretty low on water. I didn't really know where Tim was, but uh, I remember after I slipped and slid down one rock, I looked forward and there was Tim with water, <laughs> came to save the day. And at that point I realized that everything was gonna be all right. Luckily Tim survived, saved my life. Thank you, Tim. I got here as fast as I could. Yeah. And that was half a mile an hour. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think I'm going one third mile an hour. We got about a mile left, I guess now. And we'll get to my house, it's tacos. Tacos, look, there's the tram. The tram. <laughs> <laughs> basically how I feel about it now. <laughs> so I met up with Tim, took some water, recounted what was going on, and then probably walked about 0.3 miles per hour down the rest of the wash, just, you know, going very slowly all the way down. And eventually we made it. You know, we made it to the very bottom of the tramway down there in Saline Valley. And as you come out, you just see this crazy large white stuff that used to be a lake. And that's where the, the borax and the salt were harvested back in the day. Uh, back to Tim's car and the final terminal station of the salt tram. Getting salt way out of there. <sighs> that was the most difficult hike I've ever done in my life. It's the most difficult day, the most uncomfortable day I've ever had. But it's done now. I guarantee you I will never walk this all tram again. And being out there, you just realize how inhumane this environment was. I think it was peaking over 120 when we were down there. And I think it just reminded me why Death Valley has that name. You know, it's very dangerous to hike out there. It's probably more dangerous than any of the mines I've ever been into. Uh, to be honest, it made me a little bit more nervous than any of the mines I've ever been into, but all is well that ended well. You know, I got out of there, Tim brought up some water, we made our way out, and uh, I'll say this much, I don't think I'll ever walk the salt tram again, but I'm glad I did it one time. And if you're thinking about walking the salt tram, uh, I think my first piece of advice would be don't. It's, uh, it's quite difficult, and if you do, maybe do it in the winter time and uh, pack a tent, and make it a two-day thing. That would be my advice, but glad I made it out of there. <laughs>